know me now, I can now die a happy man having walked onto stage to that piece of music. I know you wanted us to talk about Fox B2, but we thought, what a cool opportunity to talk about Star Wars. Um, uh, before we go any further, I'd like to introduce uh, our Fox B2 group MD uh, and my partner, Charles Tom. Thanks, Jess. Um, yeah, so Jess is a very happy man, as you said, um, but we, we actually uh, going to do more than just uh, realize Justin's dreams today. Um, we're actually going to talk about the world of uh, commerce um, and creativity and where these two intersect. Um, we're going to use uh, Star Wars as a case study um, to talk about some of the business and creative principles that we've learned and applied to our business over the last few years. Um, and we're going to talk about George Lucas, a young director um, that shook up Hollywood and changed the way that uh, the Hollywood business worked forever. To understand uh, just how uh, forward-thinking Lucas was, you really need to understand uh, the times. And uh, America was going through massive social upheaval at the time. Uh, major change absolutely everywhere. Um, inflation was at an all-time high. There were oil embargoes. Uh, Vietnam had left a massive scar on the American consciousness. And there was a general feeling of negativity and pessimism. Uh, Richard Nixon went out there and said, I'm not a crook. Well, we learned not only was a, a crook, he was also a liar. So everyone had actually lost faith in their leaders, uh, and there were certainly no uh, heroes to, to look up to um, at this time. And the movies of the time really, uh, really actually reflected this general sense of, uh, of pessimism. Um, and there was certainly no uh, uplifting uh, movies at, at the time. Movies like uh, Towering Inferno, um, Earthquake, um, really reflected the, the best practice of the movie studios at the time, and that was really to tap into the general angst of the 70s. Um, and uh, all, the, all the movies really, like Chinatown starring Jack Nicholson, MASH was essentially a movie about Vietnam. Um, Anti-heroes like Charles Bronson, uh, Clint Eastwood, Dirty Harry, French Connection, these were all very gritty th best practice thrillers of the, of the time. Um, and certainly there were no fantasy movies around at the time, um, let alone uh, sort of space fantasy movies. Um, the films at the time were, were movies like uh, 2010, um, which, sorry, 2001. Um, that's the sequel. Question the, the relationship between man and machine. A film like Planet of the Apes, um, which was about uh, the apocalypse. Um, and this movie was considered a success with a $16 million profit at the time. So when a young director uh, by the name of George Lucas went around uh, to Hollywood studios with a story which uh, was essentially a galactic fairy tale, uh, there were very few takers and he thought he was crazy. So a lot, of, uh, a lot of studios actually passed on uh, the opportunity to, to make Star Wars and often feel they must feel like that guy who passed up on the Beatles. But, uh, you know, Lucas is actually, uh, he talks about it quite a bit today and he, and he says, he doesn't blame them, how do you try and explain the concept of a Wookiee to a board of directors, which is <laughs> a really good point. And the two uh, studios in particular that passed up on him were, were Universal and United Artists, who are obviously, as we know, major players. But uh, luckily for Lucas, um, 20th Century Fox had actually just appointed a young, uh, a young creative affairs vice president by the name of Alan Ladd Jr. And Alan Ladd Jr. was pretty visionary. He, he always says he never actually understood Lucas' script, but he understood Lucas as a filmmaker and he trusted his vision. Um, and he really put faith in George Lucas uh, rather than the storyboard necessary that he had in front of him. I was fortunate there was one guy in the film business back when he said, you know, I don't understand your films, I don't understand your script, but I think you're a talented guy and I'm going to invest in you. Who was that? That was Alan Ladd Jr. at Fox, and that's how I got Star Wars made. Um, once, the, uh, once the deal had actually been signed, the 20th Century Fox guys thought, you know, if we're actually going to make a huge loss here, this is going to be a massive flop. Let's try to limit the downside. So they started enforcing certain best practices of the time um, onto George uh, Lucas and his vision. And one of the best practices of the time was to cast big A-list actors, uh, because then you know at least people go and see the actors. But Lucas really stuck to his guns here, and he felt it was absolutely critical that he still um, he cast unknowns, because he felt if people had an emotional connection with certain characters that these A-list actors had played before, he wouldn't get that emotional connection uh, that he needed for people actually to believe the film. And uh, I'm going to show you a couple of clips, and Star Wars might be a very different movie today if he hadn't stuck to his guns. Again, there's no mistake. You can't find Organa Major? Well, I found it. It's just not there. Oh, I found it. It's just not there. Anyone recognize where Perry King is from? I'm going to show you age. Riptide. I don't know if anyone remembers Riptide. 
Um, some other A-list actors were considered for the, for the role, Richard Dreyfuss for the role of Han Solo, he just came off the success of Jaws. Uh, Sissy Spacek was uh, considered for the role of Princess Leia. And uh, Christopher Walken also considered for the role of Han Solo. Uh, but Lucas really stuck to his guns. And one of the more bizarre casting decisions, there was actually a request for Burt Reynolds. Um, I always say, judging by this picture, you might have think they were casting for the role of the Wookiee. But um, it was actually Han Solo that he was also, also, uh, also considered for. But uh, Lucas really stuck to his guns, and of course now Carrie Fisher, Mark Hamill, and uh, Harrison Ford are, are everyday household names. But uh, what Lucas really did appreciate is that he needed uh, an actor with gravitas for the role of Obi-Wan Kenobi. And uh, so he cast Sir Alec Guinness, but then he killed him off in the first half hour of the movie, which was, uh, which was definitely not best practice at the time and had the uh, studio execs in, in quite a tiz. So another best practice request that came via the studios was uh, uh, fueled by that thing that, that sort of uh, breeds best practice, I guess, called research. Um, and research at the time showed that uh, the youth were into disco music. So they suggested to Lucas that it would be a great idea to have a, a disco soundtrack to Star Wars. And, and throughout the process, again, the man stuck to his, uh, to his guns. Um, he believed in his vision and, and, and that he knew uh, what would work for the film. And what would work was a classical piece of music, which was probably a, a good idea, a good thing, because uh, had he given in to that request, Justin and I may have walked onto stage to something sounding like this. Um, another important uh, thing that Lucas really fought for uh, was his opening credits and obviously today we see it all the time, you, 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 you often won't see the, the actors' names listed or the production companies up, up front, but at the time this was actually part of the, uh, the Directors Guild that ins insisted that you actually had to credit actors and everyone up front. Once again, as Charles was saying, the same way music was so important to him, he realized he probably had about the three, first three or four minutes to suspend disbelief with this audience. And classical music was an important part of that, and actually um, leaving out the actors' names up front. And to this day, he's still not a member of the, of the Hollywood Directors Guild for that reason. He stuck to, stuck to his vision. And as uh, he progressed with the film, he got more and more strange requests coming down from 20th Century Fox. And the strangest one is actually that people would find Chewbacca the Wookiee offensive and that he should please put pants on the Wookiee. <laughs> Once again, if he'd given uh, into, their, into their request, <laughs> Chewbacca would be a very different character today. Yeah, so one of the, one of the frustrations that he, that he faced uh, throughout the production process was that they kept, uh, they kept running out of money. Um, and, you know, Lucas being the visionary that he is, um, and, and as determined as he was to make his, uh, his vision come true, um, he actually offered to forego or to take a massive cut in his director's fee. Uh, the studio bosses were convinced that the movie was going to be a flop, and they, uh, they were only too happy to cut what they thought would be their, their future losses. But he was very clever about it, because at the time, um, nobody was doing any merchandise uh, spin-offs of uh, blockbuster films or big films. And Lucas saw the potential for this. So very smartly, um, he said, I'll take a cut of my director's fee, but I want the merchandising rights in return for that. Same thing uh, with the, uh, the marketing. Um, as uh, the film uh, went into the, into the marketing process, um, the studio bosses weren't keen to, to invest behind it. They kept thinking this movie was going to be a failure. They kept trying to cut their future losses. Um, so the call was made not to, not to invest behind it. Once again, Lucas had to rely on his own, own uh, resources, and at this point he made a telephone call to, to Marvel Comics. There was certainly no best practice at the time when it came to this kind of thing, and, and Lucas realized he needed to find innovative media channels to actually get his movie out there if they weren't going to put big money behind it. Um, so he recognized the potential fan base in comic book geeks and, uh, and science fiction fans. So he actually phoned up uh, Stan Lee of Marvel Comics and said, look, I've got this movie coming out, uh, you know, the studios aren't helping me. I actually want to make a comic book of the movie before um, it actually breaks. 
and it's actually really interesting to know that the mo that the comic book actually came out months before the before the movie. But he realised if he could just build up this base, um, it's almost like a seeding strategy uh, that he'd eventually get enough ground support for the movie. So when it actually broke, he'd at least be able to fill the theatres, and and word uh, and word would spread. So he went to these comic book conventions. He gave uh, he gave T-shirts out to uh, to all the all the nerds and and uh, and he actually. He, he was lucky in that he actually had all his, um, you know, his life-size Darth Vader um, figures and uh, actually already built the robots, R2-D2, C-3PO. So he actually wheeled them all into these comic book conventions. And of course the artwork of Star Wars is just you know, absolutely amazing. Um, and he was actually able to show a lot of the artwork which got the guys really um, pumped up and excited what, what was to come. He set out uh, velvet ropes and put the characters on, on red carpets and really managed to build up um, a lot of hype uh, way before the movie was, was actually released. Another key thing for Lucas was partnering with a conceptual artist called Ralph McQuarrie. And what Ralph McQuarrie did was actually um, allow people to just get a sense um, of, the, of the grandeur and the scale of, of Lucas's vision. You can see these are some of the early st um, storyboards. And early on, Lucas actually used these storyboards to sell the idea to Alan Ladd Jr. and 20th Century Fox. Um, I guess it's a lot like you know, when we all pitch to, uh, to a client, uh, we won't have the luxury of having the finished product in front of us, but we can still give them a sense of, of what we're imagining. And Ralph McQuarrie was, was such a key partnership for George Lucas in actually getting his, his vision out there. Um, and as you can see, some of this early artwork really, really informed the, the direction of the, of the movie. Really beautiful stuff. So once the film was produced um, and came to the, to the release date, the studio bosses were still uh, convinced the movie's not going to work, it's going to be a flop. And they only released it in 30 studios around the, sorry, studios, uh, cinemas around the country. Um, and queues started forming around the block. Uh, people came out of the cinemas only to walk straight back in to watch the film a second time. <laughs> Some people watching it up to four times a day. Um, and it actually became an event where people would uh, drive across uh, state lines in the US to make it to the, to the cinema houses where the, where the film was, uh, was being screened. At this point, finally, um, the you know, 20th Century Fox realized that they're onto a winner here, um, and they started to, to invest behind the film, started marketing the film, um, and exposed it on a, on a massive, uh, massive scale. Once they'd done that and put money behind it, it really started uh, crossing borders, went international, obviously. And it was an early example of, of, of characters from movies actually transcending their genre. Um, you know, you'd expect to see them in movie publications, but suddenly they were on People magazine. Um, people were naming their kids Luke, maybe. Um, and uh, it really uh, started shaping popular culture, and it's a great example of, of, uh, of, of forward thinking um, and transcending boundaries. So the film made $273 million at that point. Um, here's a lovely note from Steven Spielberg um, congratulating George Lucas on overtaking Star I thought Draws as the most uh, uh, popular film or the, or the uh, most successful film at, of the time. <laughs> um, and everybody loves a winner, so these guys were only too keen to announce that Star Wars had now become the most successful motion picture. They doubled their stock price, and there's a very nice invoice. Some rather large amounts. Very nice invoice. Um, then when it came to the merchandising, as Charles said earlier, um, you know, Lucas had done this deal where he got the merchandising rights and 20th Century Fox really didn't believe that um, you know, this was going to take off. So they were so ill-prepared when Star Wars actually broke. Um, the movie was released in May of 77 and uh, come December, little Johnny's all around America just wanted Star Wars, Star Wars, Star Wars figures. And uh, the guys were actually, um, they, hadn't, uh, they hadn't done the deal with the toy companies and nothing was actually ready. So when December came, Father Christmas would bring around an empty box <laughs> with uh, on the outside it would say Star Wars figure coming to you and you'd get your little um, early, bird, uh, early bird certificate, um, which must be quite a letdown under the Christmas tree. And you'd get this box saying come and get it in uh, between February and June, <laughs> which is quite sad. But then, uh, you know, once the guys realized they, there was something to this merchandising uh, idea, which had never been done before, uh, then they just you know, went crazy and, and Star Wars has is, is got emblazoned across everything from cereal boxes you know, to boxer shorts, the action figures um, really, really took off. And nowadays, obviously, big studios time the McDonald's toys and everything to coincide with the release of the movie. But back in 1977, there was nothing like it. Um, and you can see everything from T-shirts to masks really, really uh, just blew, blew out of proportion. He's wearing his Darth Vader boxes right now. 
this isn't a mindless exercise in talking about Star Wars, actually. We want to talk a little bit now about um, you know, best practice versus better practice. And from all the examples you can actually um, um, see we've spoken about, there were certain best practices of the time, but Lucas didn't follow them. He stuck to his vision and uh, he created a better kind of practice. And I saw a lovely um, interview, it was about two years ago, and one of the critics was actually scolding George Lucas. And he said, your movies are so Hollywood. And he just said, yeah, I can't help it, they copied me. We identified seven learnings, I guess seven principles, business and creative principles, that if we've had any success over the last five, six years, we feel has been principles that have served us well um, in our business. Uh, point number one comes back to what we were saying earlier about um, best practice. And best practice cannot be applied to truly original work. And we see this in an example of Star Wars. But obviously, if we look at our industry, in particular advertising, for lack of a better word, or creative industry, um, if we look back at some of the most successful ads of, of all time, it's for example, Cadbury's Gorilla, there's an ad that targeted, wanted to target the youth and get them to eat chocolate. Can you imagine if that gone into research, the guys would have said, but you, you're using a song by Phil Collins, the balding ex-Genesis drummer. You, you want to appeal to the youth, use something more contemporary, the same way Lucas had to fight for his classical soundtrack and not have a disco one, because he realized that the music was at the core of what he wanted to achieve. And, you know, hats off to the agency, realizing there's no greater joy than the drum solo in Phil Collins in the air tonight. Um, you can also look at some of the most successful beer advertising of all time, was up, not a drinking shot in sight. So it really comes back to the point of best practice cannot be a try, uh, applied to truly work, original works. This is the second one, um, and arguably one of the toughest ones, actually, um, is have the courage to see your vision through. Um, and I think it's such a hard thing when you, know, you have that creative vision or that creative idea um, when it's just, uh, just born to see that thing through the whole process to the point where it gets set free into the world is a tough process. And it takes a bunch of courageous people, um, in our case, in, in, our, in our agency team, um, in our clients, um, to not compromise. Um, and I think if we've learned anything, it's actually when, when that idea is born, um, it's not kind of one big compromise that, uh, that messes the idea up. It's, it's a series of small compromises along the way that finally erode away um, to, to compromise the, the idea in a big way. Um, and it's, it's hard for people to see that vision in the beginning when the idea is just born. And I think we've been quite fortunate that you know, we have a deep appreciation in our agency for the fragility of an idea um, and what it takes, the, the kind of the courage that it takes to, to see that idea through to, um, to the final stage. A lot of people tell you that you're going to fail along the way. Sometimes you do, um, but you've got to have the courage to see it through. It's a fact of uh, kind of resentment, I guess, that everyone feels when one finds that uh, somebody who has the money, or has the, as a result of the money, has the power, they can make like aesthetic directorial writing decisions, which they have really no business making. In order to get my vision out there, I've really got to learn how to manipulate the system, the system, because the system is designed really to tear you down and destroy everything that you're doing and push it off to the side. So this third one is very, very important. Whether by luck or design, we managed to, to get this right. You know, choosing, choosing the right partners is everything because you know, these are the people that are going to stand by you um, in those dark days when you're trying to protect that vision and see that vision through. Um, we're fortunate to have partnered with some fantastic clients at our agency. Um, and I think this is just something that uh, you know, we can't stress enough. You've got to take so much care in choosing your partners, whether it's clients, whether it's uh, your business partners, or the, the people that you work with in your team. Um, is absolutely critical. Um, the fourth point here um, is uh, better practice can yield uh, better results. Just, you know, when you, when you apply best practice to, to an idea or a problem to solve a problem, you, you're going to get expected results most of the time. You're going to get, uh, it's a formula um, that you work towards or work according to, and so you're going to get results that you've seen before. Um, to better practice really is about breaking the mold, about breaking the courage to, or having the courage to break that mold to do things differently, um, to risk failing, um, but you're going to get the returns, you're going to get unexpected uh, results at the end of the day. And then number five here, um, better practice can set your business free, and I think we saw this uh, with the George Lucas example where he was prepared to cut his director's fee um, in exchange for the merchandising rights, and he was very clever about that, but what it did for him was really set him up um, to set up his own film studio, and from there on in, he could pursue his vision, um, his creative vision, um, on his own terms. 
And I think this is something that we've tried very hard to do in our business from day one, is, is structure our business in a way where we can take risks. Um, you know, certainly in the, in the, in the early days, um, we didn't really pay ourselves, but we, we made sure that our business was in a position to, to take risks um, and that the business was in a position to fail um, and not go under. And I think when you, when, you, when you do that, you start taking decisions for the right reasons. Um, you make decisions uh, for the sake of the creative integrity uh, of what you set out to achieve. And uh, when you do that, I think, funnily enough, you also start seeing um, your, your failure rate dropping um, and you do better from there on in. Point six, better practice can shape popular culture. And we spoke about this a, a little bit earlier. And if you want to try and shape popular culture, you can't be following best practice because people always have a point of reference. Um, you need to lead them forward. And that we heard from our, our sponsor earlier talking about pushing boundaries and, and taking people with you. And it's an incredibly hard thing to do because there's always a naysayer somewhere that's saying, oh, you can't do that. Um, there's a great quote, you know, Damon Hurst, uh, when he put the, um, the sheep or cow, was it in formaldehyde? Someone said, I could do that. And he said, yeah, but you didn't. And that's so key. Um, when you're trying to push work, you've got to take the initiative and lead pe take people with you. Um, you can't expect people to tell you what, what they want. And finally, uh, don't put pants on the wiki. Um, this is something you hear spoken around the Foxby 2 offices quite a bit when, uh, once again, we're trying to push things and push boundaries. It's really easy to fall back um, you know, to, to best practice and continually try and, and, and push things. And you know, you've got to choose your, choose your battles. But you know, if, if you're with a client, for example, and, and they really are, you feel like you're getting nibbled to death by ducks, just Look them in the eye and say, come on, don't put pants in that wiki. Um, and you can really see your vision through when, when, you, stick to your, when you stick to your guns. Okay, so here's a piece of work that uh, we'd, we'd like to share with you. Um, I think most of the South Africans in the audience will be familiar with it. Um, but it's a, it's a piece of work that we did for our client, uh, Brandhouse, um, for their, for their drive try initiative. And you know, this was the idea when the, when the team came up with it, it felt like we were holding a, a hand grenade. Um, we knew this was going to... Um, cause uh, create waves, um, and we presented it to to the client, and they were absolutely terrified. But you know, credit to them, they were courageous about uh, about going ahead with it. And we faced a lot of pressure again, like a lot of small compromises were asked for along the way. Um, you can imagine a, a sort of a corporate legal team looking at an idea um, that that could be controversial. Um, there was some pressure from 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 the from the parent company internationally. Um, but the local guys really stuck by their guns and, and wanted to see this through. Um, one of the requests that came through is we actually wanted to uh, feature actual reformed prisoners in the, in the commercial. Um, and the legal guys were not happy with this. And, and Justin just felt at the time that to get the authenticity and the realness um, in, the, in the commercial, we, an actor wouldn't do. Um, we had to get real guys in there. Uh, to get that uh, to get that grit, and it paid off. Um, it was uh, it was on air for about uh, I think about a month. Um, the client spent three million rand uh, behind the campaign, and they got 14 million rand in media return. Um, it actually got pulled after uh, it featured in the British High Court uh, when Shreen Devani um, was fighting his extradition case. Um, they showed this ad as a reason why he shouldn't be extradited. <laughs> for our um for our international, uh, international delegates, the phrase Papa wach for you means daddy's waiting for you. Hi, my name is Leonard. I'm looking for a special person. I'm looking for a soul that is, is energetic and is understanding. I don't know what to say. I like a really nice, pleasant body. Someone that can handle heavy situations <laughs> with a smile. These hands will never let you go. <laughs> I'm quite demanding physically. I have all the time in the world for you. I want to change you. Don't be scared of me. I'm not an animal. Papa, wow, well. And that was, a, that was an amazing uh, 
you know, client and, and agency experience where their bravery um, paid off. As Charles said, they earned 14 million rand in, in earned media off a 3 million rand budget and got people talking about the subject of drinking and driving in South Africa. And, and really, you know, we'd become desensitized over the years to seeing pictures of car crashes and, and motherless kids. And we knew we needed to, you know, take a different tack. So obviously there was a massive shitstorm when this all uh, when this all broke. But you know, so when it came to presenting the next campaign to to our clients, we were quite curious to see uh, which way it would go. And it was amazing to hear them say, you know, you've got this amazing insight here that when you decide to drink and drive in South Africa, you're going to come into contact with people you probably spend your whole life trying to avoid. And it's something very unique to South Africa, and we need to build on that insight. So when we um, decided to do the follow-up campaign, we really wanted to build on this. And uh, it was shot uh, once again by, by Robin Good of Giant Films, shameless punt Robin, wherever you are. And uh, we really wanted to capture that authenticity again. Um, and this is the new commercial that, uh, that broke on, on Monday night during the Academy Awards. And already we're seeing it's uh, really gone, um, you know, gone quite uh, crazy. It's been on the front page of the newspapers, um, social media, it's, 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 it's really taken off. And uh, it's just for our, South uh, our international delegates again, here in South Africa, we've got quite a dodgy tow truck driver culture where these guys are actually seen as vultures and predators. They sort of hang on the outskirts, you know, waiting for something to happen. They've often got access to police scanners and this kind of thing where they can, you know, be the first at, a, at an accident. So really great for us to see our client asking us to build on something that uh, we created before with them. We also wanted to take the idea um, online and uh, it was actually interesting, the first campaign, it was a consumer generated Facebook page of 17,000 members, which was, which was awesome for us to see, called it was a Papa Bach for your page. Um, so this time around we actually have created a Drive Drive Facebook um, page and on this page you can actually go Go into uh, go go onto the Facebook page and actually uh, select someone's name who you'd like to appear in the actual um, viral. Uh, once you send it, then it actually goes into their Facebook inbox and they'll uh, they'll receive the viral in the inbox. Hey, Rabbi, this one is for you. Daddy, little blue eyes coming for you. Uh, we actually partnered with Thunder.com the previous time around and wanted to build on this partnership. And uh, the way Thunder works, once again, for our international visitors, it's this online social website where you can go see your pictures uh, in galleries. I haven't seen you at Trinity for a while. I hope you come back for a few drinks. I'd love to drive you home. We partnered once again with, uh, with, with Sasha Waldman, a uh, photographer who's based half in New York and half in Cape Town. And uh, he brought uh, the, the idea to life in, uh, in, in print and outdoor in a, in a really dramatic way that I think once again um, captured the, uh, the authenticity. Devalue you slowly, love you to death. Miss your hands in summer. Feed our arms for love, murder.
Great, thanks very much, guys. It's uh, what a great uh, opportunity for. Um, Yeah, for us to open design in Java, it's a, it's a dream come true, and, and thank you so much.